I have a series of questions I'd, I'd like to ask, and uh, by no means is this any kind of strict guide. You want to go off in other conversational areas, just let me know. But I thought we'd probably start with the, maybe some of the more painful memories you've had in your life, and those are the memories of your youth. Your life story is an incredible one. I, I watched your 1993 interview uh, with, the, with the Holocaust Memorial Museum, and I was moved. Are, are there those days back in Slovakia as a little boy, those days still with you in many ways? you think about them a lot? No, I do not. I try to not to think about those days. Not good. Mm -hmm. You were, I think you, you said at the time you had to use an assumed name at, at times. Ru Ruban. Ruban. And why, why Ruban it's, instead of Ruben? Well, the, made from the I, it was easy to forge from the I to an O. That was my father's explanation. And he was, of course, right. And uh, it was more Slavic than Ruben. It was, it was a very Jewish name. Right. And so this had more of a, a, a Slavic sound to it? Yes. Letting you blend, perhaps? Yes, uh, and, it was, it was, and it was easy to forge on the documents. Right, right. You, um, you talk about spending so much of your childhood in hiding. It's supposed to be a carefree time, a time when you're exploring the world. We were like bounty, you once stated, I heard you say in an interview. How's that experience impacted you? How's that experience affected you? I still remember it. And uh, uh, my memory is sometimes, uh, in spite of my wife's thinking, my memory goes back to when I was two. And uh, the... Uh, most of the memories growing up were not, they were not that good. And uh, so I try not to dwell on the bad parts of my youth as opposed to my good parts. You think back on those days as a boy, kind of the net was closing in, but you probably weren't aware of it. You still have some, have some good memories, some normal gr kid memories growing well, up, playing no, in the street? Well, I remember my grandparents being, my father's parents, being taken. I went to the train station to say goodbye to them. That was probably 1942. And, and you would have been how old at the time? I would be five. Five, 30, born in 1937. 37. And uh, I remember going to the train de uh, depot saying goodbye to them, I knew then I would never see them again. You knew that as a little boy, some sense or... For sure. You become an adult very quickly, you once said. I, I did say that. Do you, want, do you feel you essentially missed out on, on childhood? I never had one. Where there's a sort of... Never had a, I, never, I never had a good childhood, as you put it. Right. Uh, I was, uh, I was an adult when I was, <laughs> I was a baby. Right. You were aware of a Second World War raging outside of oh, your Oh yeah, I remember, go my brother and I, I remember going, we were living at that time, I think it was, I think the, uh, the German army invaded the Ukraine in, I think, 1942. 40, 41 or 42. 41, yeah. And I remember going, we were living in Pressure at that time, and uh, I was going out to the main, main street, and I remember the Russian half-tracks and trucks and tanks for two days and two nights, nothing but going up to... Uh, invade Ukraine and, the, and uh, Russia. And, you know, for a kid that, that young, it was fascinating to watch all those half-tracks and all the Army equipment going to uh, Ukraine. So that would have been, you, would have, you'd have, you were watching Operation Barbarossa, as it's called, at the age of Of course, four. I didn't know that then, but uh, I'm sure you're right. And uh, it was just a... Uh, a sight to behold. You know, as I was listening to your life story, you, you were essentially turned in by the daughter of the family. Yes, yeah, she got paid hiding. by, by she was, I guess, my father told me after the war she was uh, hooking or 
for the uh, for the Germans, and uh, she turned us in for a, for a you know a reward. For so we were. So it was interesting the way they, uh, the Gestapo agent caught us, and uh, uh, of course my brother and I denied that we were Jewish, so he made us pull down our pants and. In those days, uh, Gentiles were not circumcised. So uh, he figured out very quickly that we were not Gentile, we were Jewish, and uh, he, uh, he arrested my mother and my brother, myself. My father was not living with us at that time for the simple reason if we got caught, we all wouldn't be caught at the same time or caught at all. And uh, so we wound up at the uh, Gestapo headquarters, and first person we met was our father. He was caught the day before. And so you would have been six years old at this? 1940, 43, 44. So, so I was six. seven years, six, seven years old. The person who essentially sold you out then? Was the daughter of the uh, of the of the people that were hiding us. They were, of course, they were getting handsomely paid, and uh, she, got, she got paid by the Gestapo people. Ken, it's kind of a difficult question. Maybe it's a dumb question. Can there ever be forgiveness for such no a No questions are dumb. It's just, well, if I don't ask, know the answer, I won't ask, tell you. <laughs> can there ever be forgiveness for such a deed as, uh, as you look back? It's not this? a question of, for, of forgiveness, in my mind. It's a, uh, people will do for money a lot of things. Uh, personally, yeah, I made a lot of money in America. Uh, but uh, life, life is not about money, it's about name. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the only thing I treasure is my name. Integrity then is the issue. Well, in integrity, uh, uh, only time I've ever gone to court was that somebody besmirches my name. Mm -hmm. I don't sue anyone. It's just a principle of mine. You were sent to Theresien, yes. Theresienstadt. As yeah, well, actually, my father bribed the Germans to send us there because what? he knew there was no gas chamber there at that time. He knew there was one about, well, he didn't know, but we found out there in Theresien that there was a crematorium about oh, three, four miles outside of the, uh, the camp. Terezin used to be an army fort. Mm -hmm. So that's where we were in the bar barracks over there. And that's where everybody, and that was like a transit camp. A lot of people from Terezin went to Auschwitz. Is Terezin also the sort of the model camp where the Germans would allow the well, Red Cross uh, into the... Well, they let the Red Cross in. We never saw one person from the Red Cross. That was a year and a half before we got there. And, uh, but most of the people that went to Terezin was like a transit camp. From there they went to Auschwitz, never to be seen again. As time passes, your memories of Terezin, let's say, become any more or any less painful to you? Are they kind of frozen in your consciousness? No, well, I don't talk about it. Uh, you know, this is a special event, and so I, I do talk about it, but most of the people don't even know I'm, where I'm from, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't make it, I don't try not to wear it on my sleeve. It's a... Uh, very few people know much about the Second World War. I know you're a historian, but uh, most lay people have no knowledge or maybe even interest about that. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons I think the museum does a tremendous service to this country. Good, I'm glad to hear that. We've dedicated, I mean, the museum is dedicated to keeping well, it. I understand alive. that. That's one of the reasons I belong to it. Right. The there, there's recently been articles written, perhaps you've seen them, that very small percentage of people, young people especially in America, even recognize the name Auschwitz, not even sure what it means. Well, it's not taught in schools, and uh, uh, 
I remember in L.A. I was in high school, and I had a history, European history class. It was I was shocked. I knew more than she did, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a teacher. So I almost flunked the class because I interrupted her and I corrected her, and I don't think she liked that too well. Okay. <laughs> As a professor, I can tell you that, that can be a painful moment. <laughs> yes, but I was right. So that was that's the most. That, well, that's the most important. For me, it was, but uh, uh, I got a good grade anyway. But uh, irrespective of that, uh, most people don't know much about the Second World War or what happened. Do you think we've um, we as uh, as American society are we failing to? educate our young people in history generally? We're mentioning the Second World War and the Holocaust right now, but how about history in general? Do you think we're doing a good or bad job in passing that out? I would put it fair, not terrible and not great, mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. Certain areas, I think there's, some, there's a historical consciousness, for example, of the Civil War. Oh, yes. Certain aspects of the Second World War, D-Day perhaps. Right. I agree with that. But there are others that you would think are not being done as well, and you're including the Holocaust. Though. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember seeing your earlier interview, and you, you talked about there's a painstakingly vivid description of, of the trip in the cattle uh -huh. car. Can anyone who's not there even I, I, I get, I get very know? emotional when I think about that. Yeah. It uh, was a long trip. Because we made, I don't know, how many stops to let the troop trains pass us. And uh, I remember the, the uh, odor in the car after uh, the first day. And uh, there, was no, there were no uh, facilities at all. There was one basin. And in an hour or two, the odor was just unbearable from then on till we arrived in Terezin. It's not that far away from where we were. We were in a camp called Serret, which was like a transit camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took days to get to, to Terezin. And uh, we all couldn't sleep at the same time on the... I don't know if you've ever seen the old or the, even the new... Freight cars, yes. they're much smaller than the American ones. Yes. And we all couldn't lay down at the same time and, and sleep. So t everybody took turns for a few hours laying down, and, every, and the other half, other half of the people had to sit up to make room for the ones that are sleeping, then the reverse. And uh, every now and then they would stop and give us some water and some food to eat, you know, bread, or just to sustain us. But uh, it was a long, long trip. I appreciate you talking about that. I'm sure that's not an easy thing to. Well, to just the, really the worst part was the smell in the in the uh, in the freight car, mm -hmm. and uh, the freight car was not the size of even this dining area here. It was a little bit smaller than that, and. We all couldn't lay down at the same time, so half of us had to sit up and let the other half lay down and sleep. When you, when you look back on this now as a very successful member of American society, do you think there's more America could have done at the time to, to prevent some of the horrors that you and I are discussing right now? Well, I don't know why they never bombed Auschwitz. So that would, t tell me your thoughts on it. Well, I just think... You know, reading about what they didn't do uh, is beyond my comprehension. Uh, somebody made a decision. Not They must have known. If two people know about something, it's not a secret. And uh, Since it was being discussed, it wasn't a secret. Well, right? I don't know. I wasn't here during the Second World yeah. War, but yeah. I'm, I'm sure uh, Roosevelt must have known about uh, Auschwitz and the other concentration camps that were death chambers, basically. And uh, they didn't bomb them. May I take you back even before that, perhaps? I'm yes. just asking you sure. right now as a student of, of history and a knowledgeable sure. man. Um, was there something, do you think, the Western powers, the United States or Britain or France, could have done to 
stop Hitler's rise early. They certainly mm. let him do what he wished and, and let him push the boundaries and, and, and until eventually they had a war on their hands. I, I wonder what, if you could give me any thoughts on that. Well, you know, I, during the war, I didn't think about it, but, you know, but I do read. Right. And uh, I, our conversation already, <laughs> I know that you read. I can tell. Uh, but uh, for whatever reason, between the State Department and his advisors, didn't advise him to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. By him, I'm talking about Roosevelt. Right. When you, as you know, the museum is, is going to have a, a Holocaust exhibit in the new Liberation Pavilion. Yes. The Anne Frank galleries, be called, and then they came for me. When you read the story of Anne Frank, she, she was a bit older than you, but, but essentially the same cohort, your generation. Do you recognize your own story in some ways? Well, uh, I give my father credit for keeping us alive till towards the end, 1944. And actually, we were liberated after Berlin. That's when the Russians turned around and came down to liberate us. And they were, so Berlin was already con conquered by the Soviets. Oh, absolutely. But Terezin, uh, Terezin was still... Still, they were still there. I remember after we had rumors that the Russians were going to come and liberate us. So my brother and I went to the embankment because Terezin was a fort. At, at Maria Theresa's time, it was a right. fort. So there was an embankment. There was a flow, there was water when the, in the old days when it was a real fort. And uh, we went to see the Germans retreat. So as they were retreating, they started shooting inside the camp. I could hear the bullets over my head. And uh, my brother and I were laying on the embankment. I remember that vividly. And uh, till they passed. And then we went back to the barrack where, where we lived with my mother. They separated the males and the females, except for the kids that stayed with their mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember getting a spanking because she knew what, what happened, okay. And uh, uh, it was after the fact, I didn't see the point of it, but that, nevertheless, I still remember the spanking I got from my mother. You, I wanna get that, you, I'm gonna establish this. You and your brother right. watched the uh, retreat of the German army. Right, right on the embankment of the camp. Uh, from the embankment, and, and you're being fired at. Yes, they, were fire, they didn't fire at us, they were firing into the camp. Whoever was in the way got, got hit, hit, but uh, I could hear the bullets flying over my head, yes. And then your mother spanked you. Yes, because we, weren't, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. So yeah, well, that's what kids do. History is a mixture of a big story and a personal story. Well, right? that's a that's personal right. story, okay. That's fantastic. And, uh, and somebody was watching over us. Obviously, obviously. If we can go into the post-liberation uh, time for a, for a moment. Can you can talk me through your post-liberation story? You're still in Slo you're, you're back in Slovakia and Well, first we, we, no, first we were in, and we walked. My mother only think that she took with us, my father, my mother, and myself, she took sugar and flour. And I've asked her why she took those two things. She says, well, you, I can make bread with that. We can eat. And after she said that, even as a kid, it made sense to me. Because uh, I remember while we were in the camp and I used to see flatbed trucks every now and then come in with dead horses. That meant we're going to eat meat. Mm -hmm. It was that simple. I mean, so you're walking, you're, you're leaving Theresienstadt and you're walking where? Where? to Prague. It's not that far, but there were no bridges of any kind. So we had to walk to Prague. They, they couldn't, there was no other transportation. So we, uh, 
I think it took us two days to get there, but it's not, it's really not that far from Prague to Terezin. And uh, uh, so we were there for a while, and th I think it was a Jewish agency, I think, Hayas, and uh, so they gave us some shelter, and then we wound up eventually in Bratislava. And my father... The capital today of... Today of Slovakia. Slovakia. Yes. And even then it was the largest city in Czechoslovakia. And it was one country that time. And uh, uh, so we were there for, I don't know, close to a year, I guess. My father was on the... <coughs> he was a detective on the police force. His partner in in uh, Preshov ran the business while he was playing cop. And the business was? It was furniture manufacturing. Uh, they had this, my father was a very uh, smart man, also very ambitious, and they manufactured furniture. But the, the business was from the forest to, to the sawmill, to the furniture factory, and exported the furniture. Slovakia is a forested land. Yes. Yes, it is. And uh, especially the part of the country on the eastern side of, of Slovakia. And uh, we lived in between Poland, Hungary, and the Ukraine. Uh, they were not, still are not very far from there. And uh, so he, uh, he was on the police force for a short time, so we lived in Bratislava and uh, till he caught the, the Gestapo person that uh, caught us and him. Uh, Your father apprehended the Gestapo agent? Yes. Who had arrested him? And us. And, and the family? Yes. And he went to the trial, and he went to the hanging, because we weren't the only ones. And then we left and went back to his business. In Preshov. In Preshov. That, that's, you have, a, you have an amazing story to tell. That perhaps is one of the most amazing parts of it, that your father was able to apprehend the same yeah. man. Well, like I said, and I think I got that from him, not everything is about money. Yeah. I mean, money is like a... Without money, we would not have gone to uh, Terezin, but we have been gone to Auschwitz. So he bribed the Germans to send us to Terezin. To them, it didn't make a difference. To them, it was just money in their pocket. Can you tell us something of your family's decision to move to the United States? How did, how did that come about? Well, it was all about anti-Semitism. Please tell me more. It's not simple. Uh, I used to be called Parshevi Jid. I don't know Jid if... Jid is Jew. The Jid is, is Jew. Okay. Scabby. Scabby Jew. I remember that. You remember that specific instance. Oh, yeah. Or Parshevi Jid. I remember all those good phrases. And this is after the war, so... And during, after, didn't, Hitler's, make, Hitler's didn't, make, didn't right. make a difference. Your father, was it your father who was the one who made the decision to come to the no, United States? My, it was mostly my mother's, actually. She had, my, I had two uncles, who, one of them survived Auschwitz. The other one was survived, she was with us all through uh, the war. She was single. And she was the only female in my mother's family. The rest of them were all males. She had a brother that survived Auschwitz, and the rest of the brothers were in America from way, way before the war. And uh, so she, uh, uh, they had visas number 40 and 41. They started at one to come to the United States. So the decision sounds like it was made early. Oh, yes. I mean, there was no question about, not, about staying there and, and, uh, and, not, and not to come. We all had visas because in those days you had to 
and you know nobody knew about the Rio Grande, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, everybody had a visa, and my uncle and my aunt had visas number forty and forty one. That's very very high because they started at one, so. So this would be nineteen. Am I speaking in nineteen forty six? Yeah, nineteen forty six. And that's when the family moved. The two of them moved to New York. Got it. And eventually, they all wound up in California. In California. So there's a New York phase of the Rubin family, and then there's you, you moved cross country to California. Yes. That happened one day overnight, or was that? Oh a no, it was it was a it was a conscious decision. Uh, my father had cousins here, and my mother had a brother that arrived in California. I think in the late, either late 30s or early 40s, because his one of his sons had asthma, and this was the California at that time, especially Sun Valley was uh, here in LA. It was the cure for the, the air was the cure for for asthma. Nice clean dry air. Clean dry air, still a God's country. The when you look back on you know again your childhood could say something to those boys who were calling you names at the time. What would you like to tell them? Not much. I mean, it's it kind of, they didn't learn it on the, you know, on the street. They learned it from their parents. So, uh, Hatred is often learned at home. Is that the lesson? Well, most of the things in life you learn at home, you don't learn on the street. And, uh, you play on the street, but, but you don't learn to be anti-Semitic at home. That's where you learn it. Are there many, many Jews left in your old hometown, your old district? There are a few. You know, it's hard to leave a place where you were born and raised. I had no problem leaving New York. The summer, the humidity, I <laughs> didn't enjoy. Uh, as, as a... If you're not a fan of humidity, I invite you to spend more time in New Orleans. The I've been there. World capital. I, I just came back from from uh, uh, our grandson's graduation in Washington D.C. for three days. I think three days it rained, and Sunday, when we were at the mall, it was hot and humid, and it was not enjoyable. <laughs> the, the graduation was, is because our grandson is brilliant, but. Uh, uh, he got two degrees, which made me very proud. And uh, he's, uh, he and his brother are two exceptional boys. How important is education? Probably, I, sp I figured out how much money I spent on education. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, I can. $260,000 a year. For the... For the four of them. For the four of them. I got also grandsons that are twins. How do you think we as a, as a nation, I was asking, talking about history earlier, do you think we're, think we're educating young people well, well enough, as well as we should, as well as we could? Oh, there's, no, there's, there's always room for improvement, but uh, I'm very fortunate because I've been very, very lucky, and I also work hard, so, and uh, I don't think I could have been as successful as I am not if I would not have been in this country. I think this is, personally, I think refugees are probably more patriotic than natives. Why is that, Mr. Rubin? Because natives cannot appreciate America. And uh, you can't convince me I could have done as well being married to my wife and have the kids I have and the education they're getting in any other country. We, there's a phrase we use as Americans all the time, land of opportunity. It is. Is well, America the I, land of opportunity? Well, I'm living it. I'm an example of it. If, if, if not, for, I couldn't have done what I've done in any other country, maybe Australia, and uh, or even Canada, but not any place else. Uh, the the uh, 
the Europeans are set in their ways. Uh, the opportunities are not there as they are here. Things are more wide open here, I guess. Is that well, I think they are, and they're getting uh, more restrictive, but still there is, if you can't make it here, you can't make it. Do you remember your first view of the New York skyline? Yes, I Talk sure to do. Talk about that. I'd love to Sure. Hear I was, uh, we came in on the Queen Mary. I stopped being sick because we were, our stateroom was at the lowest level you could get. And I, I got sick once we left Southampton, and I didn't stop getting sick till we found the breakwater in New York. And so I was, by, I was standing at the, on the deck as we passed the Statue of Liberty. Very emotional. You weren't sick anymore. Uh, no, no, because we, the break, you know, we were past the breakwater, so it was smooth, and I, I was not sick. And before they didn't have any stabilizers in those days, even though it was the Queen Mary, it was a troop ship, and uh, uh, it was very emotional for me. A Statue city, of Liberty. A, a city. You were seeing a city that dwarfed the size of any city. Well, that no, that didn't scare me. But it was interesting. My first impression of New York was the West Side Highway. Are you familiar with New yes, York? I am. Okay, the West Side Highway was busy, and the first time I saw yellow cars. What the? What kind of country is this with yellow cars? Cars should be black. <laughs> <laughs> Taxis, you know, I knew taxi. They were every country that I, I went black, through too. were black. And if you go to London, they're still black. And uh, interesting, I didn't know, what the, why the hell do they have yellow cars? Okay. I didn't know they were taxis. So. <laughs> Growing up then in California, what was that like for you? What, was uh, it, were you seeing it as, the, as a kind of paradise that so many Americans? Well, well, I came here when I was 16 yeah. from New York. Okay. So, you, uh, so you were there until you were 16? Yeah, okay. yeah, five years in New York okay. and in the Bronx. Uh, five floor walk up, which is really six. Yes. Okay, because there's no ground floor. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it was New York was a closed city. Yeah, the unions controlled it, and it wasn't like California when we came here. I, my mother had a brother that lived here. Here in Los Angeles? Uh, Los Angeles. It came in prior to the war because of the, his son, one of his sons had asthma. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason they came out here. And uh, there was, LA was different. It was a wide open city. Uh, opportunities were uh, unbelievable. And uh, I remember the San Fernando Valley was lots and lots of orange trees and uh, houses were being built and uh, everybody was working and uh, it was a, weather was unbelievable. Less traffic? Uh, much less traffic. They had uh, electric buses, they had uh, real cars. Uh, and uh, I think General, Elect General Motors fixed those up, so they had all buses. <laughs> then on, they took away the, the trolleys, and uh, it was another world out here. It still is, in my opinion. It still is. Uh, in World War II, President Roosevelt you know, famously said the United States was fighting for the four freedoms. And he said that was freedom of expression and freedom of religion, and then freedom from fear and freedom from want. When did, when did the fear that had to have been a part of your little boy life, when did it begin to dissipate? When did you start saying this is... When I got off the boat. The moment you got off the boat? Just about, yeah. You knew you were in a, a new land. Yeah, I knew they were not going to call me Parshivijid. You began to feel free. Yes. And how long before you became an American citizen? It took five years. So five five years. 
Yeah. And so I became the, a citizen here. But in L.A. In, L, in, in Los Angeles. Yes. And you were how old at the time? Then that would have been well, t- 21. Was, but, but no, I was, I think I was younger. I was uh, 16 or 17. Okay. Do you, 17, I think. More sort of contemporary question about today. Do you think the U.S., the United States, still stands for FDR's vision? How well, it's you, different. Is this still a free country? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All this protest. You, you can't do that all over. The fact that we, people often say the protest is a sign of dissension within our society, but you're yeah. seeing it as a sign of health? No, I don't see it as a sign of dissension. I mean, they have a different opinion. Everybody's a right to their opinion. I was at UCLA in February, and I heard Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, speak. And yes. There was a lively picketing of his speech. No kidding. Well, they pick on everybody, so it's an equal opportunity. <laughs> so he should just, yeah. he should feel good. He's part yeah. of the gang? Yeah, he, well, he's a Democrat besides. Imagine if he would be a Republican, what would happen at UCLA. That's a good point. Rahm Emanuel has impeccable liberal credentials. He's right. being picketed by the left. Well, his yeah. brother is a, uh, I think he runs one of the uh, companies, uh, what the hell do they call it? The, he represents... A lot of actors, and hmm. so, you know, he's... One of the ta- uh, talent agents. Talent agency, yes. I think one of the, the biggest one in Beverly Hills. Thinking of your, as we talk, it's almost as if there are there two lives that we're talking about, your, your young life and then, then the life as an adult and, and now into the present well, day. Well, i got to tell you, I don't think about the old life. I, I'm in business, and I like my business, and I like working. Uh, I think uh, I want to be carried out in a casket. I don't want to. I don't. That's what I think about retirement. I don't. Uh, work. Work sustains you. Work still. Work energizes you. To me, that's not work. It's fun. Okay. I. I think I'm good at it. And. Uh, I didn't steal this, okay? <laughs> and uh, uh, well, when we got, when Pam and I got married, I had to borrow my cousin's car because I wasn't sure about my car making it up to Tahoe. So uh, uh, I don't mind working. And I, she, if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you I used to come home to have dinner with the kids and then, le- then leave the house and do some more work. I looked at, at night, I looked for properties. I was I started building single-family homes, and I decided to build more apartments and other. Now I build only income properties. My wife likes to use the phrase recurring income, so she kind of likes that and. I happen to agree with her, so I don't build houses anymore. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and uh, I do. recessions, no recession, I build. Don't care. You're a you're a success story, and you you've, you've already said the United States is still the land of opportunity. Do you? So we built a pretty good thing here. You you believe? I don't Should think. We, I know. You know. <laughs> I live it. How, how much responsibility do we have to help the rest of the world experience the freedoms that we Well, it depends what you call the rest of the world. Tell me. Uh, we probably give away more money than we should, but, you know, that's, a, that's an opinion. I may, I may be wrong on that. Uh, By definition, if it's an opinion, you can't be wrong. So. Well, it's only my opinion. Yes, right. Okay. Uh, the uh, it's, it's probably a good thing because uh, you can sleep good at night. I have no trouble sleeping. So <laughs> uh, one of the reasons we uh, are involved with the museum is, and we are involved with the Holocaust Museum, and. I belong to a lot of lot of different nonprofits, and uh, and I also understand if I wouldn't have any money, they wouldn't ask me. 
and uh, I'm on a lot of boards other than the World War II Museum, uh, the, uh, but it's only my time and my money. And I, and I sleep good at night. Philanthropy, that kind of oh, involvement yeah. is important. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm on a lot of boards, a lot of different nonprofits, and uh, if you don't have time for that, what do you have time for? As you, as you look around at our country today, what gives, you, what gives you hope about America? What gives you hope for the future? It's only temporary. Everything in life is just temporary. You know, it's, uh, uh, everybody, you know, complain about, t today the, the left complains about Trump, and, but they take the tax cuts, they take all the good things that he does, and they don't say anything nasty about that, and they complain about everything else. And that same thing is, is true if it's a uh, Democratic uh, president. Uh, so the, the right is complaining and bitching about that. And, uh, but they, as a, they all try to do their best. They can't expect any more. So. As you, let me flip that question over if you don't mind, as you survey America today. Anything that really, you look around, see anything that concerns you about the direction in which the country is heading? Not really. You know, I mean, there's always room for improvement. Uh, the uh, civil liberties are pretty much under control, and there's always a certain small percentage of people that are either bigoted, uh, you know, complain about everybody else, they don't look at themselves, and uh, uh, I have very few prejudices. I don't, can't think of one, to be honest with you. Uh, there's some good people, some bad people. You take them as they come. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, I mean, a, a more specific question, you, you, your family left Slovakia because of anti-Semitism. You don't want to be part of it anymore. Part of it, part and opportunities here. Opportunities uh, here. And, and even though my, my dad was, uh, well, I'll give you an example. He had a Mercedes convertible. There were two. Hitler had one. He had the other one. Okay? Uh -huh. And he wasn't a Nazi. Okay? <laughs> I gather not. <laughs> so, uh, it wasn't about money. Life is not about money. Do you think anti-Semitism is increasing in America? You've lived uh, a whole probably, life there. Probably not. Probably, the same as it was before the war, during the war, and after the it's war. A relative constant. Yeah, I think so. I don't... Uh, big difference here is you don't take it. You don't have to tolerate it. Tolerate it. You don't, well, if somebody calls you, you know, a d dirty Jew or something, you can hit them in the mouth and not fear retribution. So you're right as an American. Right. Do you? By the way, you I know I understand you're from Italian. Yes. Okay. You know, what would you do if somebody would have called you a wop? I know what my father told me to do. Okay. What did he tell you to Bop do? In the mouth. Yes. Would he have told you that also in Italy during the Second World War? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. That's the difference. Wop, Dago, you know what, a few you know, others as well. Do you know what, they, what it stands for? What? I've been told it stands for without passport. That's, no, without, yes. Papers. Without papers. Without papers. Undocumented alien. Yes, without papers. So the same sort of slurs go on and on. Right. And on yeah, and on. Just, you know, you know, you know what, why kite? Where that comes from? You heard of that, right? I'm not sure. You have not heard of that? I'm not sure. For, every, for, for Jewish. Right. Okay. The immigrants, when they came in the 10s and 20s, the last, they came from Poland or from Russia. Their last name ended up with K-I. K-I. Okay. It was not simple. Okay. 
There's always a reason for everything. The, so the American dream still lives for you. Yeah, I lived the, I lived the dream. I think on that note, I have asked every question I would like to ask you. Okay. I wonder if there's anything you'd like to add that you don't think we've touched upon that you would like to that you'd like to go into any further? No, I just think it's like I think I mentioned it a few times. Uh, I what I think about a lot is how lucky I am to You're live not, here. Are you an optimist? Do you get up every day and say today's going to be even better than yesterday? I never think it's going to be a bad day. I. Uh, my employees, I get to stay forever. I don't treat anybody any different than I would like to be treated, and uh, I have a uh, Russian girl. She went to school here. She speaks perfect English, and when I used to approach her, she used to get up because that's how they do it in Russia. I says. Don't, don't do it here, okay? When I come, I'm just like everybody else in this office. And she does, she, she's very diligent. I mean, she, and she's terrific. She speaks perfect English. And uh, it's my only requirement. I don't care if they're Hispanic. I don't care whether I got Asians, I got, you know, Russians, I got all kinds of ethnicities that work for us. And uh, I don't a, think... A microcosm of America. Yeah, and I don't consider them slaves. Okay, they just people that are trying to make a living. As you know, the National World War II Museum has, you know, talks about the American spirit. Right. You, you seem to be someone who's... We're going to the event. Great. Okay. You seem to be someone who's suffused with it. You, you are the American spirit. You have the American spirit. Yeah, well, I think it's the greatest country in the world. Closest one, there are two, Canada and Australia. I was going, now that's the second time you've said that in our brief talk here. Yeah. What, what is it about Canada and Australia that attract you? But the same thing is it about America. Wide open? Uh, more or less, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I have, we have relatives in Australia. As a matter of fact, we're going there in July and uh, to Australia. And... Uh, Opportunities are there, same as here. Uh, it's a microcosm. I mean, it's only about 20 million people in Australia. And uh, you think you're in Sydney, you think in L.A., except they have a nicer harbor. Okay. And a beautiful opera house. <laughs> yes. Uh, and his, he built his condo. You can one floor, one condo. And one view is the opera house and the bridge which you can climb. I don't know if you know that. You've seen the picture of the bridge? Yes, I know that. You can. It's, a, it's a private enterprise. The guy that thought of it, it's made a fortune. Because it's, I think it cost $100 to go and climb the bridge. And uh, it's busy all the time. People <laughs> go climb that thing. And uh, my wife and I did it. And uh, the opportunities are there too. I'm going to say that um, our gain is Australia and Canada's loss. Right. I'm glad you decided to come here to the United States. Well, the reason they went there, they would have preferred the United States. The reason they couldn't get a visa, and they told them you forgot about the Rio Grande. <laughs> you could have walked across. <laughs> so, uh, but they've done well there, and I have cousins in Canada. They couldn't get here either. No visas. And uh, so they're successful. Easier to get a visa in Slovakia in 1946, where you're number 40 and 41. Well, I don't know what number we were, but uh, we had a visa to, uh, to get out. And uh, we got out just in time because about, oh, maybe, I don't know, a month or two ago, prior to us leaving with the visa, that's when the communists took it over. They threw Masaryk out the window. <laughs>